Hello, good evening. Uh, thank you for uh, coming today, tonight, uh, for the uh, presentation, our last session of uh, ICOR Aberdeen uh, regular meeting. Uh, my name is uh, Human Tahtechi, and I'm a uh, ICOR Aberdeen chair. This is actually my uh, last month that I'm chair. So from next year, hopefully, we will have uh, another uh, committee structure and another chair. Uh, so uh, this is our last session, May uh, session, last session of 2021, 2022, uh, which is a technical presentation uh, by uh, plant integrity management. Uh, which is uh, about safety and environmental critical elements. It's time for rethink by uh, Martin Wolf. Uh, just a couple of announcements before uh, I start. Uh, uh, please note that the meeting uh, is actually a live broadcast at the moment. We are uh, doing online Zoom. Uh, we have about 35 plus people at the moment uh, already joined uh, online. Uh, it is recorded uh, and we are going to uh, post it uh, on YouTube channel. Uh, after that, uh, if you go back to, to our Piper Aberdeen YouTube channel, you will see the last two years of recordings there. So you can go back and rewatch. Uh, for the question and answers, uh, for the people in the room, uh, we will start question and answers after the uh, presentation finished uh, from uh, from the room first. Uh, Dr. Oli uh, will uh, take your questions, but please uh, wait for the microphone because last time uh, people were asking questions and the, the audience on the Zoom, they couldn't hear them. So please wait for the microphone to be passed to you. Uh, and uh, after that, we'll go for the questions uh, uh, from the audience online. Uh, so please, uh, for the audience on uh, Zoom, please use the question and answer box, not the chat box. We, we probably will miss them uh, among the other uh, messages. So please use the Q&A chat box, sorry, Q&A box. Uh, so that's it about the announcement. Uh, so if you have already seen from the, the flyer, we will start with the, uh, some introduction uh, uh, about ICOR Aberdeen. 
uh, we were planning to have AGM as all uh, as every year uh, for the last session of the uh, year, but uh, the problem was that we couldn't finalize the committee uh, in the last committee meeting. Uh, still, uh, a couple of uh, uh, places are open for uh, to be filled. Uh, we were we had a couple of uh, people stepping down due to the work and personal. Uh, uh, problems. So we are actually waiting for the chair and vice chair to be selected. Plus, uh, we are actually looking for new uh, committee members. So uh, we already have identified one person, CJ, is, is joining us uh, for next year. Uh, I would say 70, 75% of the positions are already filled, but uh, until we have the chair and vice chair for next year, we can't have the AGM, so it's postponed for next year, September. Uh, so just a couple of uh, things before we go for the presentation, just wanted to uh, thank our branch sponsors. So this is only branch sponsors. We have sustainable uh, sponsors, gold sponsors, and uh, corporate sponsors, which you can find them uh, on the i website. But these are specifically i, -I Aberdeen branch uh, sponsors. They have been, most of them, they have been with us for the last few years. Uh, and just wanted to thank them because without them, we couldn't arrange all of our I mean, all of these meetings uh, and seminars uh, on a regular monthly basis, paying for the venue. And at the same time, I mean, uh, this year we are also running the Young Engineer Program, which uh, we have to uh, pay for the prizes and other stuff. So uh, without the, the sponsors, we couldn't uh, actually uh, survive. And uh, if, if you are not a sponsor and you're thinking of, uh, supporting IPAR Aberdeen branch, uh, please contact one of the committee members. Uh, so this is kind of an old photo before COVID. Uh, so we still didn't get a chance to, uh, to take a, a group photo from the new committee structure, but this is almost uh, everyone in the, in the committee. Uh, so let's go for the list at the moment. Uh, this is the structure for this year. Uh, Dr. Oli, vice chair, has been supporting myself and the, the, the committee last year uh, for all of the activities that we are doing. And he's in charge of, actually at the moment, in charge of uh, uh, preparation of the program for, for the next year and also uh, annual corrosion forum, which is happening in, in August. So he's arranging all of this stuff, a lot of work. Thank you, Dr. Oli. Uh, Dr. Nigel also here, where you are? Yeah, here. Yeah. He's uh, our external secretary in, in charge of, uh, I mean, ma magazine write-ups uh, and the uh, correspondence externally with the uh, other uh, institutes and com companies. Uh, Lian Ling uh, here, she's our uh, internal secretary. I think she, she will remain as internal secretary for the next year. Uh, a lot of work uh, for, for internal secretary, including uh, arranging the uh, monthly meetings and the uh, minutes of meetings and, and so on. Brain Roberts, not here. He's in charge of uh, uh, financial stuff uh, for ICOR Aberdeen, uh, communicating with, with the headquarter and council. Uh, Peter Furness, our sponsorship officer, uh, again in charge of communicating with the sponsors. Amir uh, Atachi is not here. Uh, he has done a lot of work with the event co coordination. You probably have received some uh, emails from him, uh, invitations, Zoom setups, and stuff like that. Uh, actually, uh, CJ is going to take his role uh, from next year, uh, but Amir will support him. Lila. Uh, I didn't see Lila today. Uh, Lila uh, joined us last year, and uh, she's uh, the university liaison uh, in charge of communicating with the students in University of Aberdeen uh, and RGU. And we also have started communicating with the other, a couple of other universities, uh, Strathclyde and 
uh, University of Manchester for promoting our events and uh, inviting uh, students or the uh, professors to do some uh, presentations before us. Uh, and also the CPT officer, uh, Dr. Yunan Gao, who has been uh, chair for a couple of years. Uh, he is at the moment a website uh, officer. Uh, in, in charge of maintaining LinkedIn, uh, iCore website, iCore Aberdeen website, uh, Google website, and all of uh, the archived uh, slides and items on, on the website. Uh, Mei Ling Che, uh, she's there. She uh, also has been with us for a couple of years in charge of the memberships and young engineer uh, program and young iCore coordinator. Uh, and uh, yeah, she's helping a lot with, with communicating with, with the young engineers who want to join um, the Institute. And Dr. Steve Patterson, who has joined us, I think last year, is it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so he's, he's actually, uh, has been very kind to, to join us, uh, spending his valuable retirement time with us. Uh, and supporting young engineer program. So uh, I will uh, reach to the slide for the young engineer program, but uh, briefly mention here that he is in charge of uh, men, uh, mentors uh, coordination. Uh, one of our mentors, Steve Plant is here. Uh, so he's, he's the coordinator with, with the mentors just to make sure that uh, uh, the, the, mm, the process and everything is consistent. And he also uh, it was in charge of uh, defining uh, the case study for the last competition of the Young Engineer Program, which starts day after tomorrow. And the competition will happen in November. Uh, and a few of the previous uh, uh, chairs, Dr. Mohamed Ejaz, uh, who has been chair for a couple of years, Stephen Tate, uh, who has been last uh, before me? He was he was the chair, and the year before that, and he has been for many years with Icor Aberdeen. And at the moment, he's the vice president of Icor uh, nationwide. And next year, he will start uh, the role of president of Icor. Uh, and Alistair Sitton and Zahra also here. Yeah, uh, at the moment in sabbatical, but she will be back soon. Okay, uh, so as I mentioned, uh, after the presentation, uh, all the slides, uh, technical presentation, everything will go online on the website. So if you, you go back to the previous years, you can go back to like 10, 15 years ago and find the previous slides, photos in the photo gallery and uh, on the YouTube channel, uh, you will find uh, all the recordings from the last two years and uh, also the announcement if, if you join our linkedin uh, uh, channel uh, you can receive all announcements and post uh, any updates and news about icor aberdeen so icor aberdeen account is different from icor uh, general account so uh, if you are part of i mean you're a member of uh, icor account you probably will not receive specific uh, news about aberdeen uh, so make sure that you are also subscribing for this one. Also, we have another uh, account for young engineers, Icor Young, Young Icor, uh, that you will receive also, especially for the students, is is good uh, to receive some news and updates for the students. So, uh, as I said today, last uh, day of the uh, events uh, of 2021, 2022. Uh, there is one uh, extra event left, as I mentioned about, which is ICOR Aberdeen uh, Annual Corrosion Forum uh, 2022, which normally happens in August. Uh, Dr. Oli at the moment is in uh, discussion with a few companies and speakers uh, for the uh, specific topic that we, we have this year, which is about energy transition uh, and uh, net zero target. Uh, so if you are interested, anybody in the room or online interested to join us uh, in August, 
for this seminar. So it probably will be a hybrid session. Some people will be online presenting and some people um, uh, in Aberdeen. Uh, so we are still uh, looking for, for the speakers. Plus, uh, if you are interested to host the venue, which is a, the whole day uh, event, uh so that's also uh, a possibility last year it was in track uh and uh it, it was just after the restriction of uh covid lifted so it was our first in-person event uh, in august last year uh so as i said next year program under preparation by dr Oli, and uh you will receive it soon once we finalize the dates and the uh, the topics uh, and the annual cohesion forum as well. Uh, if you are interested in participating in anything, just send an email to uh, icoreabz at gmail.com or our LinkedIn, or uh, there are a lot of different uh, ways of communicating with us. So just an update about the Young Engineer Program. Uh, you probably have heard about that before. Uh, this is first time we are doing it in Aberdeen. Uh, it happens every two years. Uh, it's a mentoring program uh, uh, with uh, about nine to 10 uh, lectures happening every month since uh, January we started doing that until uh, October, which is our last uh, presentation. Uh, the presenters all from different companies, SMEs, uh, technical authorities uh, doing presentation in different aspects of Corrosion management, integrity management, and uh, we are preparing uh, about 20, not about exactly 24 young engineers in six groups uh, uh, with all of these different aspects of uh, corrosion engineering. Uh, after tomorrow, as I mentioned, there is a case study which will be launched for, uh, for the students to start working on them. Their mentors, six mentors will be assigned to them and then uh, they will continue working on their case studies until November. Uh, they will present it in front of a panel of judges and one group uh, will be selected as the winning group and the prize is to send them to US for the AMPP or former NACE conference. Uh, and there is one, one extra uh, prize for one uh, person with outstanding performance that they will send them again uh, to AMPP uh, leadership uh, course. And for that one, we are actually still working for the sponsor. Uh, it's about 2000 pounds. So if anybody is interested to uh, sponsor that any company, much appreciated. Uh, so the main sponsor is BP with the main prize, sending the winning group of four people to US and SOPC7 is sponsoring the venue. And this is the list of the uh, mentors, uh, six mentors uh, that they start from after tomorrow, uh, joining their groups. And uh, three judges already selected uh, from BP Shell and Net Zero Tech Technology Center uh, are helping us, supporting us for, for the final competition. Okay, uh, so after this introduction, uh, Let's go back to the topic of today uh, program. Uh, we have Martin Worth uh, today uh, presenting uh, the safety and uh, environmental critical elements uh, time to rethink topic uh, from plant integrity management. Uh, so Martin uh, is the director at EIM and has over 30 years of experience with the field of safety management in the oil and gas industry. Martin, one of EIM's uh, founding uh, directors, is an established figure within the oil and gas industry. His breadth and uh, depth of experience has been gained through a variety of technical safety roles within both operators and consultancy uh, environments. Martin is a physicist who specializes in safety management, but with particular interest in the fields of risk management, process safety, and risk-based decision-making. He gradually 
from, uh, sorry, graduated from the University of Liverpool in 1988 with a first class honors degree in physics. So please join me and put your hands together to invite Martin to the podium. You don't let me out much. So, uh, although that's a fantastic biography, um, you've maybe never heard of me. I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> and I've promised whom, and I'll try and keep it to 40 minutes. So I've got my notes just to keep me online so that I don't digress too much. Um, are we good? Yeah. Brilliant, thank you. So thanks, thanks for having me here. It's, it's good to get a chance to uh, spread the word, spread the, uh, spread the news. Um, my aim tonight is to give you probably the most entertaining presentation on Secchi's that you've ever had. I like to set a nice low bar. You've, it's probably, probably not gonna be that difficult. Um, my background's technical safety. Um, so for, 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 for most of you, I guess, and for the, for the online audience, some of this will be quite new, not, not new, but maybe not right in there with, uh, with what your day-to-day -day jobs are. However, there will be some people in here that know everything that I'm going to say today and probably agree with it or disagree with it. So I apologize to any grannies who I'm teaching to suck eggs. Um, also apologize for the fact that it's probably going to take 20 minutes to get to the crooks and get into the, the point, point of the uh, presentation. Is that okay? I wasn't expecting to hold a microphone. I might break into song. <laughs> and I do apologize if I did. You good to go? Fantastic. The, the title looks maybe slightly arrogant or um, presumptuous. It's not meant to be. It's it's not really a, a statement. It's more of a challenge, more of a try, trying to put across an idea, maybe challenging convention. Um, and something that I think is really important to get across. I'm a big fan of Ricky Gervais and he, some people think he insults people and he um, upsets people, but he just puts ideas across. A lot of what this is about is putting ideas out there just so that we can have a discussion at the end. Because I think there's some interesting, interesting stuff here going back in time. It does take a bit of working up to, and you'll understand at the end why I'm going through the whole process that I am. First of all, just quickly, and it is relevant, a little bit of background about, how do I move on a slide? What have you done? I can do that. I can do that. A little bit of background about me. Um, I graduated on the 5th of July, 1988. Um, that was a day after my 22nd birthday and the day before Piper Alpha exploded. There you go. Um, I still remember watching it in the evening, uh, late into the night on the news. Um, <clears throat> at the time, I had no idea that three months later I'd be working at BP. I don't know if there's a link. But in August, I took the sleeper up to Aberdeen and uh, won myself a job as a BP graduate um, instrument and control engineer, which was pretty good. Um, it was well paid. Instrument and control engineers, they're the ones that make the process engineers look good, but don't get paid as much, if you, if you know what I'm saying there. Um, instrument and control, emergency shutdown systems, fire and gas systems, PSVs. So there was, a, there was a big safety angle on instrument and controls. And after two years, I got bored of it. So I moved into safety engineering again at BP. And I spent the next four years of my career working through uh, uh, technical safety at BP. I then got made redundant along with thousands of others by John Brown with an E when he reorgan reorganized BP into a, a, a away from being an oil company into a being more of a financial institution. 
Um, I spent the rest of the decade in consultancy. I joined AEA Technology, Oil and Gas, who are now, I believe, kind of ESR. Um, I worked for Genesis for a while. I worked for a couple of other consultancies, Vectra, Vectra, Vectra Technology. And then um, we set up our own company up to the end of the, the, the century called Risks Limited, a little technical consultancy that we um, we were acquired by a, a large larger company in 2000 and then I spent the next 10 years as the lead technical safety engineer at Talisman who are now a Repsol and in 2011 I joined Stephen Plant at PIM um, to bring technical safety to plant integrity management. I'm putting that there just to demonstrate that I do have a little bit of credibility hopefully in safety critical elements and technical safety. Let's see if I can make the computer work. Awesome. Right. That's background about me. This is background about the safety case and SECIs and everything else. You, you probably know all this, but you'll, you'll see where I'm going. Seven days after Piper Alpha exploded, um, the government announced that there was going to be a public inquiry. Um, they put Lord Cullen in charge of it. Uh, it's not the only public inquiry he's ever done. And it took him two years to come up with two volumes of the public inquiry to the Piper Alpha disaster. If you've never read it, you should, it's really good. You still get it in the library, great document. Made 106 recommendations, I'll read my slide like you're not supposed to. The, the industry accepted all of them. And they then went away and created some regulations linked to this. The safety case regulations didn't come out till 1992. So that's four years from the Piper Alpha disaster to the regulation. So what did we do? I was in BP doing all sorts of things. And the, the, key, the key thing that we did, I'm struggling with this. And show next. There we go. Lord Cullen said, while we're writing the regulations and while we're doing the inquiry, um, we'd like you to do four studies. The fourth with studies. I don't know how many of you are old enough to remember this. Um, it was obvious that there were certain things that were going to be relevant in the safety case regime. And four studies were uh, initiated. The emergency systems review, which was all about um, fire and gas systems, emergency shutdown systems, and what they should do in the event of a major accident, how they should react. Smoke and gas ingress studies were done because a lot of people in Piper Alpha had succumbed to smoke and um, flame inhalation type injuries. Fire risk analysis is obvious. If you've got an offshore platform, where are the fires going to be? What explosions are going to happen? You need to understand them. And the evacuation, escape and rescue uh, study, which was to do with lifeboats, escape routes, lighting, all sorts of stuff like this. And, and this all... Um, This all took a lot of effort. There were big teams. There were, there were teams of hundreds of people in the industry putting together these studies, trying to work out what was going to happen when the safety case regulations finally came out, because no one, no one knew. No one knew what was going to be required. I know BP wasted huge amounts of money. They'd never admit it, um, developing philosophies for subsea isolation valves, because they were convinced that the regulations were going to require SSIVs, and then they never did. Um, so it was, it was, it was a, a lot of stuff was up in the air. No one really knew what what to expect. Just very quickly, some of the some of the recommendations from the Cullen inquiry were: you need to create a formal safety assessment. You need to tell us about your safety management system. How are you managing your threats? There was a big part of it was carrying out a quantified risk assessment. And that was to demonstrate that the individual risks and the um, societal risks to individuals working offshore weren't larger than equivalent industries. And the equivalent industries were considered to be um, construction sites and trawlers, I believe. Um, so all this stuff went on and eventually the regulations came out. And that's not how to do it, that's the right click, isn't it? And there we go. 
the regulations came out. These, these regulations, the safety case regulations that are shown here, is, it's the guidance for the 2015 regulations, which I believe are still the latest ones. They were produced as a result of the European Union directive, um, which was based on the 2005 UK regulations. Um, we didn't we didn't do Brexit fast enough not to uh, not to need the 2015 ones, um, but the safety case regulations um, were supported by new, a raft of other regulations. The relevant ones for tonight's talk are the PFIR regulations and the DCR regulations, and I'm sure you know all about that. But what came before? I thought while I was putting the presentation together, what, what actually came before, and what came before. It would appear, bear in mind, I only started in the industry in 1988 when the safety case regulations were being developed, were another set of offshore installation regulations. I think it was 1974 the last time they were, they were out, but I'm, I might be wrong. I'm, I'm not, uh, not great with these things. And what they required wasn't a safety case. It was an operations manual and a certificate of fitness. The whole regime at the time was tell us tell us about your platform create a manual that explains how it all works and you need a certificate of fitness and this certificate of fitness was essentially an mot certificate um interestingly a lot of um, a lot of um engineering managers that i've worked with over the years whenever you go and ask them for stuff they, they, they open the cupboard a little dusty cupboard in the corner and they take out the old operations manual because they were they were they were gold dust um there was nothing wrong with an operations manual and to be honest it's very similar to what a safety case looks like just slightly slightly different um there you go i've got a bit of a gripe here i don't think the safety case regulation should have been called the safety case regulations because the impression that was given by that and it's a nudge it's like the behavioral uh, behavioural control that people that the government has over over us with this nudging process. If you call something the safety case regulations, they think it's all about writing a safety case, and it wasn't. It, sh it should have been called the case for safety regulations, and that would have been more honest, and it would have been more relevant because you had to dig a little bit deeper to realise that as well as your safety case, you needed to carry out goal setting and self-assessment the big change between the old regime and the new regime was instead of it being prescriptive it was about self-assessment and goal setting quite quite simple there's there's not much to goal setting and self-assessment and don't get confused with us between self-assessment and self-regulation very different things but essentially it meant rather than us telling you what to do you go and find out what the hazards are on your platform, work out what the risks are and work out what you're going to do about it. And that's that's what that is. It's it's self-assessment and goal setting. It means that what you do is, is more relevant. Now, here's a footnote. Um, I've got a few of these little asides. What, what did we have before? We had prescriptive regulations. And prescriptive regulations were all about certification. Now, this is a, this is a great document. This is... Now, someone can correct me here. It used to be called either the Blue Book or the Green Book. I can't remember which. But I, I tried to Google it, the Offshore Installations Guidance document. And I Googled and Googled and Googled and couldn't find anything. So eventually, I put a quick note on LinkedIn and said, has anybody got a copy of this? And I got two sets sent within 10 minutes from, from people that are my uh, LinkedIn um, what do you call them? Are they friends or is that Facebook? LinkedIn colleagues. And uh, so I got two copies of it. It's 611 pages. And essentially, it's the old document that should have been titled How to Build an Offshore Platform. British, get hold of a copy if you've not got one. If you, if you do, you'll know all about it. Um, it was prescriptive regulation. And the first thing that they prescribed not the first thing, the 2.31 thing they prescribed, but it's, it was so prescriptive that they even prescribed who you had to get to certify you. The certification bodies were prescribed. It does say performed by six, the one I've missed off, it wasn't deliberate, it was, I guess, so that I can just give them a shout out. DNV should be there as well, I think. 
they were the sixth the sixth one but you had to be certified by one of these one of these bodies um and just 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 again for completeness the contents was here it told you how you had to how you should build your how you should mix your concrete what steel you should select how you should light the platform how you should paint a h on the heli deck um and each of these sections linked to APIs or codes or standards or, or whatever. I used to use it in uh, my early days at BP. I did a lot of stuff on ship collisions and there was a section in there that told you how many megajoules of energy a platform should be designed to withstand. And it, I still remember it. it was four megajoules for a head-on collision from a standby vessel and 14 megajoules from a sideway, sideways on vessel. So it was, it was that prescriptive. And you just knew if you wanted to design a jacket, that's what you had to do. Um, that's number 11. So that's, that's what we used to have. Certification, it's all about certification. Goal setting is much simpler, much more honest in my view. The, it's about identifying specific hazards on your installation, not, not some hazards that someone has decided apply to all installations. It's what hazards do you have on your installation? What barriers, what measures, what secchies have you got in place to manage them, to, 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 um, to, to prevent, to, to mitigate against them? What criteria, what, how have you defined those measures? So if you said we need a fire detection system, you then have to define what a fire detection system is. And then you apply a process and this process is key. It's all very well saying we've got a fire detection system that does this, but how do you go about making sure it does what you say it should do, checking it and then making sure that everyone keeps it, keeps it, keeps it right. It's basically the, 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 the process for, for managing it fully. Um, so let's start with the hazards part of that. The, the, the HSE made this really easy and they, they've, they've changed it in the safety case regs 2015, but essentially they define what a major accident and therefore what a major accident hazard is. A major accident is a fire or an explosion at a very high level, fire explosion, a structural failure, a diving incident, anything that kills five, or sorry, kills, that injures or involves or has the potential to to kill more than five people. And as a result of the, 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 the change from safety critical element to safety and environmental critical element, we have E, which is any major environmental incident that's linked to a fire, a structural failure, or um, a major event that, that involves more than five people. So that's, that's hazard. So they've made that really easy for us. At this point, I'm supposed to put up a Swiss cheese diagram. I don't like Swiss cheese diagrams. I've seen that many Swiss cheese diagrams over the years that I'm not doing it. I, I, I even found out that Swiss cheese diagrams were invented, I think, were invented in Australia by some Australian guy in 1991. So they're, they're quite contemporary, but they've been around for most of my career and I'm a bit sick of them. Bow tie diagrams, very, very popular, particular with senior managers um, because the clear and they show you show you what's what's going on the hazard that we just talked about is the bit that looks like a buzzy bee at the top with yellow and black stripes the accident event is the circle in the middle and the idea as i'm sure you're all aware is that the blue boxes on the left are things that cause the hazard to manifest as the accident event and following the accident accident event the red boxes on the right are what the ultimate consequences are the black bars are the barriers now it's a great model for identifying and visualizing things um here's here's a an, another example from the same site it's i won't mention the the software company but this is an example that they have on their site mm -hmm. and it demonstrates immediately how difficult it is to create a bow tie diagram and how easy it is to make a mistake i certainly wouldn't have had this on my website um the 
I don't know if you can read it, the barrier that I've circled is proper PPE anytime the student is in the lab. And this is to do with acid. So spilling acid from a container, the hazard is acid, the accident is spilling it, surely wearing proper PPE should be on the right, stopping the consequence of burning yourself, not stopping the spill in the first place. I don't think PPE, wearing PPE stops you from spilling acid. I think it protects you afterwards. So even the website of the software that was used to draw this didn't manage to get, didn't manage to get it right. They're, they're very, very useful, but very easy to get, um, e very easy to get wrong. Uh, I'm not being critical. I'm not trying to disrespect anybody or any, anything here. I'm just uh, pointing that out. Um, so how do you specify measures? What this does is it identifies measures. It identifies barriers. It identifies secchies, but it does nothing for telling you what the secchie should be. For example, it said proper PPE. It didn't say whether that was a mask. It didn't say whether that was gloves. It didn't say whether that was a full body suit. It just said proper PPE. You now, for your specific scenario, have to define what that is. Now, this is another example where the HSC um, confused everybody. Apologies if there's any HSC people in here or, or, or online, but the HSC confused everybody by defining safety critical elements at the time in two different ways. And this does confuse. One is where the actual safety critical element failing causes a major accident. And the other is where the purpose of it is to protect or mitigate against. So these are two completely different things. And over the years, this has caused so, much, so many arguments and so much, so much disagreement. Um, I was lucky enough back in the mid 90s to be, I was working in Oryx Energy at the time on Riverside um, down in Centurion Court. I don't know if you know, opposite Aberdeen Boat Club. And I still remember sitting in the office and a guy from the HSE came, he was a HSE surveyor, inspector, whatever. And he'd been involved in the development of the PERFIA, DCR and safety case regulations. And he told us that the reason there were two different types of SECI SCEs at the time was because it had taken that long to get the regulations out that they'd been pushed into getting a set out. This was, we were waiting for years. The, the safety case regulations came out in 92. It was, it was years after that before Perfear came out. And we were all just desperate to see what was in the regulations. We'd had interims, we'd had explanations, we'd had all sorts of stuff. But um, the reality is that they had to get a set out. And, and I believe that, I can't remember whether Perfia came out before DCR, to be honest, but one used one version of a secchi and one used another. And there were massive arguments about what type of a secchi was it? Was it one that failed or was it one that, that pr protected? And again, another footnote, another aside, let's get back on track. Um, measures, let's call them measures. Measures, barriers, safety critical elements arguably should be all the same thing. That's what the HSE guy said. They're all the same thing. Don't treat them differently. But people argued that measures in DCR were different to safety critical elements in Perfir were different to barriers in something else. And they weren't. If you look at the APOSC, this is, this is if, you, if you're ever lucky enough to be involved in safety case production, this is the document to go to. The assessment principles for offshore safety cases. This is what the inspectors use to decide whether your safety case is any good. Um, it's not a secret document. It's also available, as you can see, to all stakeholders. And it, it's, it's got 49 mentions of the word measures. I didn't look how many times it mentioned barriers or, or anything else, but measures is mentioned 49 times. It tells you how you should identify them, how you should go about specifying the criteria associated with them, what the inspector will be looking at as he's assessing that he or she's assessing them, how you should implement a process to demonstrate that you've got the measures in place, and also the alarm side of things, the as low as reasonably practical, demonstrating that the measures are sufficient to, to make risks as low as reasonably practical. Um, an example of, of one of the uh, one of the one of the sections in there is 
is this principle 15. There are lots of principles in the APOSC. This one is the one that says, when you identify a measure, when you choose a measure, you should give preference to measures that prevent something then from happening or eliminate it, rather than looking for things that mitigate. So for example, simple, it's, it's not rocket science, stop the explosion from happening, stop the fire from happening in, in preference to produce, providing a, a lifeboat to escape with. It's better to stop, stop the explosion in the first place than it is to make sure you've got some way of escaping. And, and it's, it's, it's this idea that, um, you know, there's a, there's a hierarchy of measures. Again, this is something else that people have clung on to. It's, it's, it's useful, it's relevant, it's obviously correct, but um, that's the kind of thing in the APOSC. So once you've taken your bow tire diagram and you've identified all your measures for, a, for an installation or a platform or, or, or a site, what does it look like? What does the list of barriers, measures, secchies, whatever you want to call them, look like? And this is two separate lists. The list on the left, I apologize if you recognize any of these from your organization, but they are anonymized. Um, there's a list on the left from one company and a list on the right from another company. The list on the left has 22 secchies. The list on the right, I think, has 53. Um, they're both right. There's nothing, nothing wrong with that. The one on the left, I believe, has um, active fire protection as one of the safety and environmental critical elements. The one on the right splits that up into fire pumps, sprinklers, ring main, things like that. So it's, it's the same thing. Ultimately, if you take it down to its, if what's, what do they do with food? It's uh, deconstruct. If you deconstruct it, it's made up of the same things. Um, But it's still just a list. It's still just a list of secchies. You've not yet, when you get to this point, actually set any parameters or criteria for each um, for, for each of these safety critical elements. So we've we've identified them, but we've we've not set anything for them. So another footnote: where, where what do you do? Back in back in the early nineties, no one had a clue. We, we, we'd seen. Um, we, we knew the safety case regs were coming out. We'd seen um, draft versions of PERFIR and DCR. And then DNV brilliantly paid for a centre spread. I don't know if any of you remember it. A centre spread in the Press and Journal. And it was entitled, No, no Need to Fear PERFIR or something like that. And, and it was... It was DNV doing an advertorial of we know how to do this, we can do this for you. And, and it, it, what they'd done is they'd looked through all the interims and draft, what I believe they'd done, I don't know what they did, I wasn't working for them. They looked through the regulations and they found functionality, availability, reliability, survivability, FARS. They coined the, the acronym FARS because it it, it didn't exist before then. They also looked at prevent, detect, control, mitigate, recover, which is that hierarchy from uh, principle 15. And, and they drew this into this, this double page spread and, and everybody just went, oh, I guess we do it like that then. It, it, that's how it felt at the time. I was, cracky, I was, I guess it was late twenties. And um, at the time I was working at AEA Technology, as I say, and I, I dug this out the other day. This was September 1995. And my manager there um, was on a working group that were trying to come up with templates for how performance standards should be written. And, uh, and I'm, I'm quite embarrassed, really. That, that, that was a, that's, that's from that document. It, this was how we wrote an emergency shutdown performance standard it it's i hope i hope you agree i wrote the word down here just so i didn't forget it um, what's the page 23 i hope you agree that it looks inadequate it's how how anyone is supposed to maintain to that assure to that or verify to 
you know, verification confirmed by site survey, function test against philosophy, or, you know, the criteria is list of initiators. It was, it's, a, it's, it's dreadful, but no one, no one knew any better almost. Um, it was just what we were doing. This was done for BHP down in Liverpool Bay. So this was their, uh, this was a document written for them. And, and what, what the certifiers wanted at the time, in my, in my opinion, the DNVs, the Lloyds, they just wanted to carry on doing what they were doing. They, did, they didn't want to verify. They just wanted to carry on doing certification because that was their business. And the operators didn't really know what they were doing. And the consultancies didn't know what they were doing. So what we ended up was, with was a, with a hybrid scenario where the, 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 ver the, the verifiers, the, the ex-certifiers, carried on doing what they were doing. And everybody else went, oh, it's fine. That's, that'll sort us because actually, if you tried to follow this, we'd be in a right mess. Um, <clears throat> more recently, we've got stuff like this. Far more detail. It splits assurance from criteria. It splits verification. It's, it's far more detailed in terms of the information. But what I'm suggesting is, in reality, we've still got a hybrid certification system. We're not doing real verification. We're still just doing certification. And just while we're here, another footnote, we're talking about performance standards and SECIs now for operational. It's not that simple. So those SECIs that we were just looking at, those performance standards, although it's still certification, it's also, we've got design performance standards and we've got decommissioning performance standards. Tonight, we're just talking about operational, but there's, there's, a, there's, a, whole, there's a whole spectrum, if you like, of of performance standards throughout the cycle. And we don't know what we're doing. We're still certifying it. Now, if we go to this, let's go back, take a step back. Let's go to type B. You remember there were two types of seconds. Let's look at the ones that I think are the more, what's the word, more honorable ones, the more, worthy secchies something the purpose of which is to prevent or limit the effect of a major accident this is properly a barrier this is a barrier this is a measure what's an example of that my favorite example always is lifeboats so how do you set the criteria for a lifeboat well it needs to have a certain number of seats Great. And maybe you need one more lifeboat than you need, if you like, redundancy um, as part of as part of your, your 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 model to make sure you've got enough stuff. That's design. That's not operational. That's design because you say we've got this many people on the platform, we need this many seats. We need three 50-man lifeboats because we've got 100 POV and therefore if one fails for what if, and that's it, that's design. You don't need to check that operationally because if you go back in a month, you're still going to have three lifeboats and you're still going to have the same number of seats. So operationally, you don't need to check that. And that's what we're talking about here. What you do need to check is does the engine start if you want it to, if you try to start it? Does it lower? Does the lowering mechanism work? Does the release mechanism work? Does the, the fire protection system that's on it work? Do the radios work? These are, these are things that are relevant operational performance standards. The reason I mentioned design and operational performance standards, you think everybody would know this now. This came in in the 90s. I was, I was on a project less than 10 years ago, I think nine eight, nine years ago, involved in, it was a Southern North Sea project. I was helping out uh, an Aberdeen operator 
and I was down in London at a tier one Epic contractor. And I gave a presentation on performance standards. And the questions I got asked at the end, I, I was gobsmacked, was when did all this come in? When, when did all this come in? And, and, and the senior engineers in the project team still thought we were working to certification. This was in 2012, 2013. It was, it was, it was, I was shocked. I was shocked. The, uh, the younger, the younger engineers were really interested. They said, this sounds really cool, but the, uh, the, the seniors didn't even know it was happening. And, and I kind of get that because we had this hybrid certification. They were getting their designs, what they thought was certified, even though everyone was calling it verification. They thought they'd just changed the name. And, um, and they've been in, in the design house for that long. That they, they, they've, they've not had the benefits of, uh, of the operational side of things. So we, we uh, how, 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 does, how does this all work? We've talked about hazards, barriers, criteria, and, and such. But what's the process? And this is, this is the key that I'm trying to get to. There's a process here somewhere. We have to have a design. We're supposed to maintain it. This is, this is just me. This is, this is just me trying to put a framework around how we manage seconds. There's some sort of design, some sort of definition of what, what the, the barrier is. Then we have to maintain it to make sure it does what it's supposed to do. Then there should be an assurance part where we make sure it's doing what it's supposed to be doing and then there's a third party independent verification so what do we do i've been banging on about certification and that's why because i think that's what we do at the moment we we design or define a secchi we maintain it using some sort of maintenance management system with inspections. And then what we do is we put a little asterisk against some of the maintenance management tasks and we call those safety critical maintenance. And we think that's assurance, but it's not, it's just maintenance. And then we bring in a third party verifier to certify it for us and agree with us. And they just check it again and inspect it again or witness, witness our inspections. And it's, it's it's hybrid certification verification. It's not what the intent was. I don't believe it's what, what, what the process is supposed to be. Let's take a step back. Type A. Let's look at type A seconds. These are, um, these are the ones that maybe corrosion engineers are more um, understanding of. These are things that, if they fail, contribute to a major accident. Now, these are oops, these are things that might be structural, pressure systems, or pipelines. So, where you actually say that the hardware bit is the safety critical element or the safety environmental critical element, and uh, how do these systems how do these systems fit? Well, these these are managed with a an IMS kind of workflow typically. And, and you'll all be aware of this. Plan, do some sort of implementation, inspection, report, review, manage your anomalies, and then review it and decide whether, whether the cycle's right. And if it's not, fiddle about with it. So how does that, whoops, escape. Oh, I don't want to do escape. How does, how does, how does that fit with, with my little model? How does it fit in there for a type A secchi, one where the actual, it's the pipeline, it's the structure, it's the, the pressure system? And I'd suggest it's not that different. We write a secchi, we write a performance standard that says the oil should stay in the pipes, the structure should, shouldn't fall down, whatever. And, and then we inspect, we maintain it by inspecting it, and we assure it by inspecting it, and then we verify it, by doing more inspection and, and on all we've done is inspect it and certify it. There's, it's not what we're supposed to be doing 
in my in my view. Now, I'm not being super critical here. Um, verification, certification, heck, it works. We've been doing it for 20 years. It's what we do. It's 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 what we do. The the HSE seems to be happy with it. The uh, the operators are happy with it. The verifiers are happy with it. Everyone's happy with it. It's you know it's it's fine, and we've made it work. But I'm still saying it is hybrid certification. It's not really where we should be. Um, and there might be a better way. And we're getting to the good bit now. Design. What should the design be? The design shouldn't be the the the. For example, if you've got a bit of pipe, it shouldn't be the. You should always operate above the minimum allowable wall thickness, or you should have a a, a structure that can withstand. It's that's too specific. What we should be saying is that the actual design, the secchi, is the management system. The secchi is the management system. That's that's the design. And if you design this properly and treat that as the safety critical element, everything starts to fall into place. Maintenance then, the next step becomes that, you just do it. So you've designed a really good integrity management system and then you apply it and that's all you need. If it's, if it's a good integrity management system, you don't even need assurance, but of course you need assurance. What's assurance? It's an audit. You audit your management system. You just make sure that you're, it's an internal audit. You make sure you're following the procedures. You make sure that you're, um, let's go back to it. You make sure that your planning's been done properly. You make sure you're implementing it. Your reporting is good. You make sure that your anomalies are good. You make sure there's no backlog. You make sure that everyone that's doing it is competent. You do, you do all the things that you would during an audit. And because you've got a well-formulated integrity management system, it's easy to audit. That's what assurance is. That's what it should be. It shouldn't be doing more inspection. It should be checking that your management system's working properly. Then verification comes along and a third party independent body comes along and says, oh, let's have a look. Let's just... Keep you, keep you straight here. Let's make sure that your management system is well formulated. Let's identify if there's any bits that it's missing. It's, it actually needs a bit of, bit, of, bit of brain now verification because you have, to, you have to think about what the management system is supposed to be doing. You examine the, in, the inspection reports. You make sure that the ass assessments are done properly. You make sure that the operator is following their own management system. And of course, there's a little bit of sampling and witnessing. Yes, of course, you make sure that the inspections have been done properly. You make sure that there's the competence there. And, and that's great. So this applies to structures, process pipe work, pressure systems, and um, pipelines. But is that all? No, of course it isn't. Because once you've done this, you can treat everything your lifeboats, your active fire protection systems, your, your valves, emergency shutdown valves, your escape routes, you can treat them all by rather than saying the sprinkler is the safety critical element or the lifeboat is the safety critical element, you say, okay, for everything, we'll create a management system, an integrity management system, and then we'll treat that as the safety critical element. And by doing that, you've got a SECI management process that, that matches absolutely everything. You've got a standard process. Design, the, the, the design is the design of the management system. The maintenance is the application of the process. Assurance is the audit of the process. Verification is an independent third party audit of the whole process. And if you think of how, where, where this goes, I'll just take a step back. I'll keep it there. Um, 
So an, an IMS for, for fire detection isn't, it's not going to be anything like as intense as an, an IMS, an integrity management system for a pressure system. An integrity management system for fire detection might be by module, what testing do we need to do? There'd be a reporting template to say, this, this, this um, fire detectors failed, this one's passed, how many have passed and failed? There'll be some sort of review process, which could be follow a simple algorithm or flowchart. Um, anomaly management will be, do we need to replace fire detection, fire detectors? And then there's a review cycle. So it might be a tiny little document. So this integrity management system for fire detection doesn't have to be a massive thing like the IMS for your process systems or your, your, your um, um, structures. It can be just a tiny little thing. And I don't think it's that onerous to do this. Um, and what that gives you ultimately is huge benefits, huge benefits. You get rid of the duplication, massive amounts of duplication through inspection, inspection, inspection. I sound like Tony Blair. Um, you inspect once, then you assure it, you, you audit your system and you get a verifier in. Far less administration. It's a much clearer process. You could have an integrity manager who just uses the same process for every one of the SECIs, exactly the same stuff, exactly the same process and it starts to make sense. And you don't have the arguments of that's not a SECI, this is a SECI, that's not a barrier, that's, that's oh, and it's, it's the type A, type B thing absolute nonsense and a common process. There are challenges. I've, I've discussed this with HSE inspectors. I've discussed it with technical authorities from different organizations. I've discussed it with to, to the end of the earth. There are challenges. One of the big challenges is that you need to trust your integrity management systems. They need to be well formulated because if they're not, it comes back down to well, it's a great idea, Martin, but I don't think our AMSs are quite good enough to get away with that. Well, that's telling you something, isn't it? And it's a big change of mindset, big change of mindset. And what we've, what we've done is we, over the last 25, 30 years, started here and it's just, it's just grown and grown and become the norm. And, and, and we, I, I, I think it's, it's worth, it's worth a, a revisiting of, of the the early days but that's just what i think and it's just an opinion and it's just ideas and i'm not precious about it i'd love to hear your thoughts the end thank you <laughs> Thank you very much for your presentation. So we'll open up the floor. Does anyone have any questions? Okay, that's totally so Hi, uh, Steve, is it working? I don't know. I don't know. Okay, yeah, Steve Patterson. Um, Martin, great story. I think it's really good to, to really go back in history and explain where everything came from. And I think that's really important, particularly for younger engineers because uh, yeah, these things didn't just appear, they, they, they evolved. Yeah. Um, but a couple of things. First of all, I mean, I left Aberdeen uh, in 2014. And when I left in 2014, we, the operator I was working for certainly wasn't doing third party inspection. Not at all. So that's not very familiar to me. Um, but certainly the verification was done of the management system. So that was already happening. Uh, and I think it's the right approach. Um, but what I want to pick you up on really is, is that you used inspection. It's integrity talking about inspection management system. I think you actually mentioned inspection. And I think it, you need to, to go back a bit and look at corrosion management because it's important to do the prevention, elimination, yeah. uh, as you mentioned uh, quite rightly. Uh, and it's, it's really about doing that RBA in front of the planning, if you like. If you can go back to that circle. So you can reduce the amount of inspection you need to do already. Uh, and then your process, as you quite rightly portrayed, becomes more effective. Absolutely. If you've got, the, if you've got your IMS correct, you're 90% of the way there. It's just, it's just there is still, in a lot of cases, not related to corrosion, not related to 
um, structures and such, the, this, this hybrid certification, which is wrong. It's just wrong. But no, if you've got a good IMS, that's, that's what I'm saying. Absolutely. I don't disagree. Okay. Any more? So I'm going to say this is our fault. Hmm? One of the operators I have worked for in the past is, was very close to your end model. Great. But we wouldn't sell it to them because it wasn't what we like to sell. We like to sell a corrosion risk assessment and an RBI and an inspection package. <laughs> and, and so we basically drove them away from your end model and more towards what we're used to selling and i think it's been to their detriment um but yeah i think we we take a lot of the blame here for for where we are now is that it's it's easy to sell the product that we sell and to repeat that product for every other client because it makes it easy for us and what's easy for us is as you suggest possibly not the best it's become the norm it's just become what's expected it's it's evolved over time and 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 it it kind of works and everybody knows what it is um we we wrote a set of performance standards for one one operator not a major major but a significant other and i thought we'd done probably the best set of performance standards we'd ever we'd ever produced and he just came back and rewrote them all because it wasn't what everybody else wanted. It was, it's a race for second place thing. No one, no one will do this until, I've, until someone's done it. And, and, and it's, it's to their detriment, I, I believe, but I'm just, I'm just, I'm like I say, I'm, I don't, I don't, is it right to say I don't care? <laughs> of course I care. Otherwise I wouldn't be here, but it's out of interest and out of, getting it out there because I think it's one of those things people don't talk about. Okay, any more? Okay, I have one. So uh, the integrity management system is kind of inherent to the corrosion guys and integrity guys. Um, have you had any feedback from uh, other maintenance departments that don't necessarily use it at the moment and seen if they would adopt this approach going forward? Uh, the, the, the approach, the, the, the feedback that that we we've had is a combination of it sounds like a really nice idea but i mean it's not something we're selling this is this is very much not not pim this is this is this is me technical safety a few years experience saying we should be doing it this way um have we had feedback no one wants to be first no one people say oh that's a really good idea but oh who else is doing it and no one else is doing it, but that's, you know, when I, when I was creating the presentation, it was, I was working my way back and it, 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 you can see where it comes from. You can see that it was the fact that the HSE were forced to rush out one set of regulations. And then you can see that DNV's center spread drove us down another route and, and all the way there's little things have happened and, and it's never been awful. We've always got away with it potentially because the verifiers, the certifiers have held our hands and looked after us and carried on doing what they've always done. So, um, and it, the HSE even now will say, hmm, maybe we should go back to a bit more prescription. <laughs> you know, I've, I've heard, you, you'll all have heard that where the HSE have said, well, you know, prescription's not that bad really because there's ways of cheating a verification system. Um, mm, I don't know, I don't know. Don't know. Certainly interesting. Okay. Um, if there are no more questions here, I'll go. Oh, one more. Yeah. Does anybody want yes. to try it, by the way? Yes, Steve, Steve Patterson. I, it's very familiar to me. So the operator I was working for yeah. is, was already doing this. So yeah. <laughs> For everything, or just for the just well, my 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 remit was really integrity. So yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, so, and most um, people are nearly doing, yeah, it, yeah. doing it for integrity. But interestingly, uh, during my tenure there is uh, my I had a different relationship with a verifier, I might add, but um, or the verification body. So did you ever have have you come across a situation where, and certainly I did this, was to actually refuse the verification? 
uh, because you can do. Uh, you then have to justify it to the regulator. But if you can justify it to the regulator, you can actually push the verifier back and say, I'm not accepting this verification. And yeah. I did that on a number of occasions, provided you have the evidence. And certainly if you, a, if you have a system like you're showing here, then I think you have a good case to push back uh, when you get that, what I would call interference rather than, than uh, assurance. Absolutely. The, the, I mean, one of the key differences between the, pa the power that the certifying bodies had was taken away from them with the verification because you, you'll, you'll know it was up to the operator or duty holder to write the verification scheme that they were just supposed to apply the verification scheme. They weren't supposed to tell you. They were supposed to apply the scheme that you gave them. And if they didn't agree with that, they could send you a letter saying we don't agree with it, but they still had to apply it and they still had to follow what you thought. And you could also go back and say, I don't agree with you. That's not right. I, I had that experience a few times in Talisman where I had long arguments with, with the, uh, the very fine bodies where, where they were just asking for silly little things. And I'm, I'm like, you're certifying me here. You're not listening to what the hazard is. You're not listening to the safety engineering behind this. And it was a struggle because they were stubborn. They were stubborn. And, you know, if, if, you, if you got your way, well, well done. <laughs> Because they are, they, they, were, they, were, they were stubborn because they wanted to do it the way they did it. And unfortunately, or fortunately, they had the support of the establishment to some extent. And it was difficult. It is difficult to push back on these, the, these, these arrangements. It's, um, it's not trivial, but what I'm trying to get across is that it's not just perform, it's not just pressure systems, structures and and other things that are naturally falling into the IMS that, that works this way. It would be much better for lifeboats to have a, an integrity management system that explained what you were supposed to look at, have a process that you went round, and then all you have to do is audit yourself and get a verifier in. You don't have to have verifiers going offshore to watch your lower lifeboats or test the motors or all sorts of stuff like this and and the cost savings i think would be would be huge but there's a bit of there's a bit of a potential barrier initially because you have to get the mindsets changed and you have to create ims's integrity or inspection maintenance systems management systems for all your secis but if if i was an integrity manager i'd be potentially pushing for it but i'm i'm not i'm just a, a lowly consultant Okay, okay, we'll go to the, oh, sorry, one more. Oh, yeah, one second, one second. Just pass the mic. Oh, sorry, sorry. You, you mentioned that this, you believe that this system is working, but the old um, system is working as one, well, the mm -hmm. existing one. So do you think that the, the advantage of implementing this system um, justifies the, the operators moving to it um, you know, I don't know, without having, I don't know. I, d I don't know. It's, it's up to an individual operator to decide whether they can see the benefits. It needs a bit more flesh on the bones. It needs, it needs someone to actually think about what's involved and how much effort, you know, that if, if I, if I went in somewhere, I'd say, okay, well, let me write you an IMS for lifeboats. Let's see what it looks like. Let's see how simple it is. Let me write you an IMS for, um, fire detection systems let's let's see how it would work and i'll tell you what it looks like and i'll tell you what you actually need to do and i'll write and i'll draw the flow chart and i i got this feeling it's going to be really simple and then you just audit it and i think you'd start by doing one just as an exemplar and then maybe someone will go that's fantastic i didn't realize it would make that much difference yeah, I think or not i yeah. don't know i've not done that but I, I think that's the, that's the, the, the that's the um, uh, the main point. Uh, people don't want they don't have that confidence that they will get to mm. where to where they want if mm. they employ it. Mm. But if they have that confidence and they know that they are not they are getting something, then they would go for it. It's, it's going to take time, but as I said, because it's not formal um, activity that anyone is doing yourself or yeah. anyone's doing. And, um, operators are not going to start it unless 
you know, they know that they will get something, you know. The, the, the other blockers are, if I suggested this to um, an operator, I can guarantee one of the first things that they'd say is, we can do that in SAP. We can do that in Maximo. It's a five minute job and the IT nerds would say, yeah, we can do that. You don't need to do anything. And all of a sudden, any benefit from me as a consultant doing it for you gets sucked away because there's no benefit to me because I don't make any money out of it. Now, I think it would be a value, and I think it's not a zero-sum value. I think the operators would gain and we'd gain, but there's too much inertia. There's too much sludge to, you know, the mindset isn't just the mindset of the managers. It's the mindset of the IT departments. It's the mindset of the person who spent untold millions on SAP and was told it could do anything. And that's what's going to stop it. Okay. I'm trying not to be controversial. Okay. We have uh, one question online, and the question is from uh, Bob Taylor. And his question is um, Should this approach not be endorsed by the HSE before going to operators? Um, the HSE won't endorse anything, they'll tell you after you've done it whether it worked or not. Is that fair? Yeah. Now I've had discussions with HSE inspectors about this and they've gone, yeah, that sounds great. Well, why don't you tell everybody, oh, no, 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 that would be us endorsing it. No, you know, it, that's not how it works. But good, great question, but they're not going to endorse it. It takes, it'll take someone to say, we're proposing to do this. This is what it's going to look like. How are you going to, how are you, how are you going to deal with this? And you'll either, well, I don't know. I'm not in an operator anymore. <laughs> well, well, hopefully things will change for the better going forward. So. Well, it's, it's ideas. Excellent. So uh, thank you for an excellent presentation and we'd like to thank you in the usual way. So. <laughs> hand you back to Herman to finish us off tonight. Yeah. Thank you very much everyone for attending. Thanks Martin for the excellent presentation very informative. Uh, so as I mentioned, this was our last session of this year. Uh, uh, please keep in touch, check uh, for our announcement and uh, LinkedIn page uh, for our next year program. Uh, we'll start, as I said, with August for annual cohesion forum and from September, our next year program. So we were waiting to test the turnout today and uh, it's fantastic. We have enough people so we'll continue with the hybrid session because uh, if we didn't have enough people in face to face in Zoom, we would go back to the, the Zoom or online, in the online, but I think we'll, we'll continue with this. Thank you very much and uh, have a safe uh, journey back home and thanks everyone online. Yeah. 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 Yeah.